I'm so excited uh, for our next group of uh, speakers, presenters, artists uh, who are going to carry this conversation forward. Uh, and really, uh, to me, feels like a really natural extension of the conversation that Gargi uh, has started, which is about supporting artists, supporting artistic expression uh, in times of tension, unrest, and our current uh, moment. Um, leading that conversation uh, today, we're so excited to be joined by Ashley Tucker, uh, who is the um, co-executive director uh, of the Artistic Freedom Initiative. Um, she's also an award winner uh, for today, so we'll be talking more about all of that uh, later in the day, uh, but we're so excited to have her. Um, she leads the planning implementation of all of AFI's uh, programs, operations, legal services um, for at-risk artists. Um, she also works for the United Nations Human Rights Committee, uh, the Robert F. Kennedy Center for Justice and Human Rights, and the Center for Civil and Political Rights. Um, artistic Freedom Initiative is a New York-based nonprofit uh, dedicated to safeguarding artistic freedom and championing at-risk artists throughout the world. Um, we're so, yeah, we're so thrilled to have you today, Ashley. It's been so lovely um, in all of our pre-conversations, and we're, I'm really excited for the conversation today. Thank you, Ian. What a lovely introduction. It's so wonderful to see all of you guys here. And, and I also just have to thank Argy for that incredible um, opening speech. I couldn't agree more that it was so inspiring and um, so much of what you shared, Gargi, was profound and extremely moving, um, but particularly these notions of um, defiance in pursuit of something beautiful and human celebration um, and collective action really resonated with me and um, ties you know, in very directly with what we are hoping to talk with you all about today. Um, Ian has already introduced me, so you guys know who I am now. Um, I am the co-executive director of Artistic Freedom Initiative. I'm also an attorney with a background in uh, international human rights and um, our organization, Artistic Freedom Initiative is dedicated to providing pro bono immigration representation and resettlement assistance to international artists at risk. So these are artists who have been persecuted or censored for their work and have been forcibly displaced as a result. Um, super happy to have you all here today with us to have this conversation. Um, this, this panel today is, is really about um, engaging in a dialogue between artists, activists, presenters, the broader performing arts community and organizations like AFI that work in the arts but within the context of uh, human rights. So what do we mean when we talk about art and human rights? Um, we talk about artistic freedom. This means the freedom to create, that is a human right. We talk about freedom of expression, the freedom to speak or express oneself, also a human right. These things are obviously vital to, to the artists um, and the art world. We talk about freedom of movement. That means you know, the ability to cross borders, um, which also means the ability for artists to perform and showcase their work. Um, so many of the artists you know, whose work is, is also a platform to speak out about human rights issues and social justice issues, experience persecution or censorship or other restrictions on their artistic freedom. Um, and these are the types of artists that AFI works with. So we often think of them as human rights defenders as well. Um, as a result of their work, these artists are often forcibly displaced from their countries of origin. Sometimes this is intermittent or temporary. Um, sometimes they're exiled completely from their home countries and can never go back. Um, in those cases, these artists are forced to flee elsewhere. Um, in some contexts, discriminatory and uh, xenophobic immigration laws and policies actually restrict artists from entering the United States. Um, or other countries, but you know, we're thinking here and when we think of examples like Trump's travel ban or all of the issues that we face um, at the border and of the many reasons that it can be extremely difficult for an artist to get a visa uh, to come to the United States. So that starts to illustrate how AFI, for example, views art, activism, immigration, and human rights as all sort of inextricably bound up together. Um, and this conversation, today was born from a desire uh, between the folks at Wavelengths and Global Fest and, and AFI to continue um, building a strong bridge between the performing arts community and um, those of us who work in the arts, but through the lens of human rights. Um, to really think about, you know, what can we learn from each other? How can we collaborate and support the artists whose lives and, and work sort of straddle these two worlds? And um, what can we learn from these artists about how to best champion them and their work? And how can we then weave that knowledge more tightly into the fabric of, of what we do? Um, 
So with that, I would like to introduce um, our amazing speakers uh, who have joined us for the conversation today. Uh, we have Mike Hoy, who is a musician, singer, and activist uh, from Vietnam. She's been dubbed the Lady Gaga of Vietnam, uh, but she's so much more, and we will, <laughs> we will hear uh, from her today. We have Richard Morse, who is a politically outspoken Haitian American musician and the legendary founder of the band ROM. We have Mira Dougal, a curator, producer, and co-founder of Habibi Festival, which is a celebration of ancient and contemporary music from Southwest Asia and North Africa that debuted this past fall of four sold out nights at Joe's Pub. And we have Jorge Francisco Castillo, a musician, librarian, and founder of the Fandango Fronterizo Festival. He's lived between the US and Mexico near the border. So to start this conversation off today, I, I wanna start with the artists that we have with us, um, Mike Hoy and, and Richard, and just ask them to tell us a little bit about their background and history and kind of center us in the context of this conversation. So um, Koi, I'd love to start with you. If you could tell us a little bit about your history as an artist and activist, um, and you know which sort of human rights issues you've become dedicated to uh, in your work, we would love to hear a bit about that. Yeah, thank you for having me today. I'm so happy to see you all here, and I'm very happy to share my story. Um, I am um, yeah before. Uh, before I became an activist, I used to be a pop star in Vietnam. And um, I, yeah, at that time, I was like the darling of the state. I was invited to perform for their ceremony on TV and radio. I had a lot of fans and a lot of shows. Um, but um, I, I was not happy about that. I was not happy about the censorship system. And uh, every time I was censored, I felt very insulted. I feel very angry, but I couldn't do anything. In Vietnam, all of artists have to submit their work to the government to ask for permission before they could performing in public or, or publishing. Um, and then, and then after that, after working under the censorship system for a long time, I found a way to fight. I, I started to organize secret concerts and shows, and I encourage artists, musicians work without thinking about censorship system. And I, I formed the band and uh, we, we performed, we wrote songs about human rights, politics and freedom. And we have a lot of followers. In 2016, I nominated myself for the National Assembly election um, to raise awareness for people about their right to participate in politics. And I, I was ejected from the ballot, um, but my, my election campaign was legitimated by the meeting with the former, the US former President Obama. And, um, and it's encouraged a lot of people participate in politics. I, yeah, the more I get involved in activism, the more I receive problems from the government. The government hate me so much. They banned me from singing in public. They raided my concert. They detained me, put surveillance on me, isolated me. They, yeah, they evicted me from my house. And uh, until I, like until last time, if it was the end of 2019, um, I received the threats that they will arrest me. So I had to leave my country at that time. I flew to New to the US and stay here until now. Um, yeah, right now I am doing another project 
the autobiographical musical project for bad activists to, um, to tell my own life story. And Koi, the, the impetus this, this most recent time for you to have to leave the US was a documentary film that was um, going to be premiered at Doc NYC um, and you know, inevitably received at the international level that was about your, your life and your activism. And yes. you, I mean, and this has happened intermittently throughout your career where you, know, you release an album or a documentary comes out about you and you understand that you're gonna face backlash in Vietnam. So you're in a position to have to leave um, on a fairly regular basis and sometimes for very long periods of time. Uh, like now, um, you came in 2019 and, and you have not been back um, since that time, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and the project Bad Activist in many ways um, is tied to the documentary because it is also, but th it's you telling your story uh, this time and right. the, the documentarians telling the story. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Um, thank you for, for sharing that, Koi. Um, I'd love to turn it over to Richard um, and ask you, Richard, to tell us a little bit about your history as, a, as an artist and activist. Um, you know, you'd mentioned a, a, a song, Embargo, that came out some time ago that kind of was the catalyst for some of the experiences that you've continued to face. Um, could you tell us a little bit about, about all of that? Well, I came from a, uh, uh, an artistic family. Uh, my... Uh... My mom's Haitian performer, singer, uh, and my my dad's an academic, and uh, so so that so that mixed race, uh, mixed cultural uh, reality that I grew up in was kind of um, kind of created question questions for me as I was growing up. Plus, it was like the '60s, and and people were against the war, and people were singing about these things, and I mean all of this. Uh, when you're a child, that's the reality. I didn't realize that the 60s was a blip. I thought that was reality. So, uh, so when I eventually moved to Haiti, I was, I was 28 years old and um, I preferred singing about things that, that move people rather than say relationship songs. And being, uh, being a much smaller country, everyone's more aware of what you're saying as a band. And uh, and uh, the, the people in the band that I was with, because uh, of the type of music I was playing, all often came from, from uh, disadvantaged neighborhoods. And, um, and so they were always kind of egging me on to, like, to, to push the borders of what we ought to be singing about. And I was also inspired, you know, so the, the embargo was, was the first song uh, that, that an actual military man actually yelled at me in the streets for, for you know, cause, essentially, he thought it was just causing trouble. Um, I was just singing about what was going on. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't saying, oh, I, I want to cause trouble. I, I mean, we're dealing with an embargo. There's been a coup d'etat. People have been killed, you know. So these are, as an artist, these are, these are things that inspire you. Uh, the song we did called Faye uh, um, uh, it was a metaphor for bringing the, uh, the, the, the leader back who had been, uh, there had been a coup d'etat, it was a military coup d'etat. And so these things kind of uh, just kind of kept building and building and the, and the public loved it. The public loved the truth um, and they sensed it. And yet my American friends um, felt the danger. Um, and uh, I, this is the first time I had ever really gotten involved in something. And the first person that brought it up with me uh, to me was the filmmaker, Jonathan Demi who thought that it was best that if, that he should help raise my profile to help uh, keep me and the band uh, safer. Uh, so this is um, the first time that uh, people are coming in uh, to give you a hand. And uh, these things are very important. Um, later on, uh, uh, the LEAF organization in North Carolina, uh, in the Black Mountains. Uh, we were introduced to them by uh, Greg Lucas of the Preservation Hall uh, Jazz Foundation, and they put us up for a month. Um, Lisa Stafford uh, from the Louisiana International, the Lafayette International Festival, uh, she was introduced to us uh, by Bill Bragan. And so oftentimes, um, 
when you're in a jam, people, people will come through and it's important uh, because as artists, we don't always know what's controversial. We're just, we're just kind of making, making music, you know, and we're saying what's going on. And sometimes, it, sometimes when you say what's going on is okay, but sometimes it's not okay. And we're just trying to be as creative as, as we can. And, um, and I, yeah. I, I actually, I mean, I, I think I wanted to touch on one really important and wonderful point that you brought up too. And um, it was about this idea that um, collectively uplifting the artists that are in this particular community is it's not just a way to celebrate their work. It is literally a way to help keep them safe. And we've had right. some experiences with, with Mike Boy, for example, where, you know, producing a concert for her and, and getting her band's name into a major media publication like the Washington Post, for example, actually helps to serve, it actually serves to help keep her safe um, when she's right. And that is just such an, such an important point. Um, and in our in our conversation earlier, uh, Richard, last week, you had you also mentioned something that I thought was really interesting. And you know, while you have been so outspoken and continue to be, you also mentioned that um, you know more recently you tend to sort of be thinking about what you're you know what you're going to say or what you may not say um, and the impact right. that can have. And I think it brings up you know Koi's talking about direct censorship, right, where the, the government is telling her literally what she can't say, but what you were conveying is more this idea of self-censorship, which so many of the artists are also um, kind of experiencing. And, and you touched on that, um, which I think is, is also very important. Well, when I was younger and, and cared less, um, I just kind of, you know, just let it flow and felt, you know, you felt invincible. Uh, once people, once you've had some attempts on your life and people around you have been killed, then you start, um, you start calculating a whole lot more. Um, I think that uh, we never used to travel at first. I mean, no one, we just played at home at the hotel. And, and now we travel and there's so much political and social instability in Haiti that there isn't much traveling there. So now we're kind of, um, well, the, the UN is upset about the things we say. The, uh, the U.S. Embassy is upset about the things we say. The uh, Organization of American States is oftentimes. I mean, because these people, these people have to have to be aligned with the government that's in place. And you know, sometimes the Haitian population sees these governments as de facto, as as illegitimate, and all that. And so you've got this conflict of. Who's for real and who's not for real? And who's telling the truth? Who's not telling the truth? Why is someone telling me I can't say this? And so, so being able to travel is important for the band. But at the same time, where do you travel? You travel to the people who are, in effect, supporting a de facto government that somehow comes out um, as the bad guys in, in, in your speech. And so then you're, then you go into that whole self-censorship thing. I mean, I've been red zone, my, my place of performance and, and livelihood has been red zone, which means that the international community can't go there for the last 20 years. Uh, the Haitian government turned off my electricity in 2014. So, so the pressure is there, the pressure keeps building. But hey, we're a band. We we make music, and and if the music uh, if the music really upsets you, then maybe you ought to take a look at something that you're doing that might not be correct. I mean, maybe well, maybe well, look at yourself. Well said, Richard. Um, I thank Koi and and you, Richard, for sharing some of these experiences about what it is like to be an artist creating work like. The, the music that you both make. Um, and I think that also helps to, to put into context uh, why Artistic Freedom Initiative, our organization was born. And it was really to, to work towards supporting artists who find themselves in, in these circumstances. Um, as an organization, we operate three programs that really try to holistically understand and appreciate these you know, very challenging, uh, complex, intersecting um, circumstances that are faced often by artists like Richard or like Poi. We offer pro bono immigration representation to artists who are in need. And I mean, 
Koi and Richard have both illustrated very clearly um, the, need, the need for that. We work on primarily talent and performance-based visas, but also asylum um, for artists who are already in the United States because often they qualify given the experiences that they've had at home. Um, our resettlement assistance program works to get work authorizations for the artists in the U.S. so that they can continue make a making a living through their craft. Uh, we've also designed and launched a residency program that offers year-long placements for artists at risk, uh, writers, visual artists, and musicians. Um, and we have a program that is designed specifically to create platforms and opportunities for the artists to showcase their work. Um, it's called Artists for Social Change. And under that program, uh, we put on concerts, exhibitions, arts festivals, um, which of course helps to amplify the work of the artist, but also helps in fact to build their immigration um, applications by creating gigs and opportunities to include on their visa itineraries. Um, I wanted to take a second too to spotlight a couple of important um, projects and, and programs in this, you know, under the umbrella of these three programs I just mentioned. The residency program, um, as I said, includes visual artists, writers, and musicians, but the musicians arm, which we've called SHIM NYC, the Safe Haven Incubator for Musicians, um, was designed and launched uh, collectively between AFI and Tommy's Dot. Um, everyone knows and loves Matthew Covey in this community, so he and I have worked together over the last couple of years to to build up a residency that's specifically geared toward musicians who have been displaced and who are needing to reboot their careers, um, whether they're in the US temporarily or long-term. Um, recently, we've been working with the um, absolutely amazing Joe's Pub team, Alex and Isabel, to provide some of the professional development for the musicians who uh, are placed for a year in our, in our program. Um, and you know, I mentioned under Artists for Social Change, we're doing these events and festivals with amazing partners like you know, Lincoln Center's Atrium, Kennedy Center, National Sawdust Symphony Space, um, Joe's Pub, of course. Um, and most recently, AFI is quite focused on Afghan artists in particular. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware of the risk that um, Afghan musicians are, are facing um, currently under the Taliban. So what we've tried to do is, is take, um, channel basically all three of our programs, the legal services, the resettlement, and um, the, the event curation and production into a subset of, um, of services that will be specifically tailored to Afghan artists and building up opportunities for them in the States. Um, we're gonna be doing the legal work to, to resettle them to make sure that they can get out of the country and um, come here for a period of time. Um, so that is a little bit about what our organization is trying to do to address some of these challenges um, and obstacles faced by artists like Richard and, and Mike Boy. Um, I wanna turn now to our presenters um, to learn more about what, what they have been doing and um, how their work intersects with these topics that, that we're talking about. Um, I'm gonna start with, with Mira. Um, Mira, can you tell us a little bit about your work as a curator, producer, and co-founder of Habibi Fest? Yeah, hey Ashley. Um, thank you everybody for inviting me to be part of this. So excited to be amongst uh, my Koi and Richard and Jorge, veterans in this scene and um, artists and producers that I really respect. So thanks for having me as a part of this. Um, those programs that you just mentioned, Ashley, were how we first connected when I was at Lincoln Center, you were crucial to making it possible for many of our artists to perform, including the Iraqi artist Hamid El Saudi, which is how we serendipitously first met. And then when you were working on SHIM and collecting a cohort of different um, presenters and industry folks in the scene to support your artists in residence, I had the chance to speak with my Koi and learn more about her work connect her to whatever I could. And so the, the evolution of my work in this field, I feel like has really been impacted by the network and the sort of, um, you know, it takes a village concept that you have really been building about what allyship means and what collaboration means in this, in this field. So when we started Have You Festival, it actually came out of a out of a ecosystem that was incredibly artist centric and full of allies. The project was born within Joe's Pub when my co-founder, uh, the amazing French Tunisian saxophone player and composer Yassine Boulars was part of the Joe's Pub working group. And that is a 
perfect example of allyship in action, where a group of artists cross disciplinary are have like have the chance to work for a year as a cohort and get the resources of Alex Knowlton's amazing leadership at Joe's Pub, all of the support they can find is at the public theater, and then all of the tentacles that that go from there across our performing arts ecosystem. And so Alex was also a key member of the origin and, and the success of this festival. And so when Yassin finished the working group and had an opportunity to kind of pitch a dream project, that is how the festival came about out of this really supportive environment um, where Yassin, Alex and I could then begin to think about like, with our love of this field and the need that we see to platform artists from the Swana region and, and you know, create more opportunities for diverse contemporary and nuanced representations of culture and artists from this region. That was the intention when we went to creating the festivals, the festival. Eventually we were able to actually host it live. It was pushed back a number of times because of COVID, but this November we were able to launch um, with four nights at Joe's Pub that were sold out, having amazing diaspora artists that were based here in, in New York in the DC region, including the amazing Ezra Warda, who is uh, active in the chat right now. Uh, we had Kinan Azme, we had Inov Ganawa, we had Yasin's Ensemble Ajoyo. And from the inception of the festival, we knew we wanted to work with AFI and Thomas Dutt um, and the SHIM program. So we baked into the pie that we really wanted to feature an artist who they're working with as part of the festival. And we had the amazing opportunity to, to have Haig Papasi, a Lebanese artist um, who has been through SHIM and part of their resettlement program. He was in residence for our festival and played all four nights and had the space to develop his new solo work space-time tuning machine. And so the, the ethos of being able to have a residency to commission new work, it was our first year of the festival and this has been baked into the concept. And now learning more from people like Michael and Richard about what, what they need out of a presenter, we're lucky that we're, we're set up with amazing partners and our, our uh, goals and ethos for round two of the festival are being informed and developing in relation to the conversations we're hearing about how to make this uh, a nurturing and supportive space to meet artists where they're at and what they what they need out of a presentation. Um, we also wanted to give a space to create context around what is informing their work. We wanted the performance to really be a space for the artists to let their work for, speak for themselves, not putting any additional emotional labor to explain their story or, or have that potentially impact the way they wanted artists, audiences to, to receive their art. So we also created a space for more context by partnering with this amazing organization called Afikra that hosted interviews and is now available as a podcast and online where we would engage with the artists about what's informing their work, but really also just to nerd out about what's happening musically with them. So the space is there for, for the artists to discuss what is influencing them, what they are, you know, drawing on, what context they're coming from in their local universes or their diaspora universes, but also really creating a space where the music and the art is front and center. Um, because I think that's also something that some of these artists in settlement are struggling with. We don't, we should take some of that labor off of, of you know, explaining whatever story, um, that has brought them to this moment, that's not the headline. Their art is the headline. And so kind of just making that really, really front and center. Um, so I think if I represent a perspective here that's a little bit more on, you know, while we have veterans, Alex and, and Yassine, as part of the festival team, we're also really nascent in the concept of the festival. And I think that being able to work with partners like AFI and learning from these artists who are here, it's helping us conceive of how we want round two to go. What does it mean for us to create more community for artists in our festival? What are some of formats and models that 
we should explore residencies, longer engagements, facilitating more local collaborations, facilitating spaces for them to be, you know, receive healing and support as individuals and not just artists, whether that's mental health support or, or ways to process the trauma that a lot of these artists are, are going through while also trying to, you know, breathe life into their professional opportunities. So really excited to, to talk with all these amazing folks and yeah, thank you for having us. Thank you so much, Nero. Yeah. All so beautifully put. Um, and I, I'd love to now turn to Jorge uh, to tell us a little bit about your work, Jorge, as a, as a longtime festival runner for Fandango Fronterizo Festival. Um, and I, I'd love to hear a little bit about the mission and, and kind of the message of the festival um, and how that intersects with what we're talking about here today. Hi, hi, thank you. Thank you so much, Ashley. And uh, hi, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I want to say hi from Tijuana, Mexico, where I'm um, staying right now. And um, uh, it's been like, like all of you know, it's been really tough for, for musicians and for artists and for everybody in the planet with the pandemic. And, and um, we're, we're all trying to uh, stay active. And um, well, I, I would like to start um, a little bit with uh, what we do in, in San Diego and Tijuana. But, um, but at first, uh, I want to go back a little bit to my background. I grew up and I was born in El Paso, Texas, and, and grew up in the border town of uh, Juarez and El Paso. And um, ever since I was a little kid, I remember crossing the border with my parents, because when you live at the border, you deal with this every day. It's part of your life. You, you have two languages, two countries, two coins, two, two of everything. So you get used to that. But um, I, I remember questioning my parents when we used to cross the border and said, why do we need to stop through this? Why do we need to show papers? Why do we need to do all this? And I remember my parents saying, my brother saying like, well, this is another country, we had to do this. And I remember saying, but first don't do that. First fly, I mean, first just go freely everywhere. And, uh, and then I said, well, but you know, it turns out that the life gave me the opportunity. And when I left El Paso, guess what? I moved to San Diego. So San Diego and El Paso is very similar because they're both border and but El Paso was a lot different especially because I grew up in the 80s 70s 80s with the, all these activities and there's very very uh, active communities uh, by national active communities in both El Paso and what is there you almost feel like you're uh, at the same place all the time you don't uh, and especially back in those days now after a year 2000 uh, when the you know everything changed, all the rules, all the laws changed to cross the border, the visas, everything got more complicated. Well, it turned out uh, very difficult for everybody. So as I moved to San Diego, and then San Diego it was a lot tougher to cross the border. But not only that, but San Diego is the busiest border in, in the U.S. I mean, they I mean they claim that it's the busiest border in the world, but um, at least I can guarantee that it's the busiest border between Mexico and the U.S. And uh, so we, we, um, we I, I started playing this music we call Son Jarocho, which is music from traditional music from Veracruz, Mexico. And it's played all over the U.S. Uh, these days, but uh, uh, we're going back uh, years ago and, and we... I mean, this music comes from farmers, from people that live in, 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 in the country. And, um, and it came to Tijuana, it came to the US, and we have this celebration called Fandango. Fandango, it's a community celebration. It's like a community prayer that we play together, like a jam session. Uh, everybody's welcome. There's never a ticket to join this play, I mean, this events. And, it's a beautiful moment. Everybody gets to participate. Um, I mean, you come in and you you bring your instrument, and you're welcome. And that's pretty much, and it's, we, we call it, it's very similar to a ritual. Like when you go to 
church, you go to a mass, if, just to give you a, bit, a little bit more background on the Fandango, when you go to a mass, you know, if you go every Sunday, everything is going to be very similar. Maybe the sermon will change, hopefully, and, but uh, most of the, the parts of the mass will be the same. It's pretty similar with the Fandango. Once we get there, you can fly from um, China and join the Fandango with your Harana, and you know it's going to be the same tunes, the same pieces. The lyrics change because we get to improvise a lot. So you can improvise your own words, your own lyrics to the particular song. So it's that's the freedom of in, improvisation that we get. But um, so we start having this fandangos at the border, but we could never get together because our friends from Mexico would not have visas to cross to the U.S. And our friends from the U.S. will feel like uh, not very comfortable coming to the U.S. to Mexico and then wait four or five hours to cross back to to San Diego, and it was so difficult. And so it was it was very complicated. So so now the one one day I was um, at the beach in Tijuana, and I was living in San Diego, but then I I I went to the beach in Tijuana and I saw this huge wall, the 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 wall that we all know about, and then it got bigger and bigger every time. Um, well, I saw this wall, and then it was a, a day to clean the beach at the, it's a world day to clean beaches. And so I was picking up trash, and then I saw this huge fence, and then I approached the fence, and I saw some families on the other side in San Diego, and we started sharing things, and they, I remember a little boy passing me a bottle of water. And I said, wow, this is, this is beautiful. And then I thought, wait a a minute this is the place where we can have our fandango with no papers no documents no visas nothing and so then at that moment i start planning and working with people and getting permits and all and 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 we did it you know we we did it in 2008 for the first time and it was so beautiful that we we brought people from all over well, the cities close by to, to Tijuana and to and the Mexican side and, and people coming all the way from San Francisco, LA, uh, Santa Ana, Arizona, obviously San Diego. So we got close to a hundred people the first time. And it was like, wow, this is, it was a total success. Everybody felt like we had an opportunity to speak up about this wall, you know, to speak up uh, against this, uh, horrible thing that was dividing us and ironically this uh, wall was we discovered this wall was made to divide us and now it's bringing us together so that was a beautiful message and and then i i remember that thought when i was a kid they said like look our music is flying like the birds we're going back and forth because the music was traveling back and forth so so it was a beautiful experience and i said well let's it was a one-time thing and then after that, everybody agreed that we should do this every year because we we can bring people from, and it, it kept growing and growing. So uh, it's always been difficult. I'm, uh, I'm gonna go to the difficult parts now, the legal parts, because we had to get permits to get this, um, uh, to, op to access the area where we have the Fandango. It's called a Binational Friendship Park. And, uh, and, um, it's been closed, like for now, it's been closed since um, the pandemic started, and we still don't have a, a date to reopen. So, and uh, and every year we go to with, uh, to ask for the permit, and there's always something new. They change the rules, they change the uh, the, the the person who is in charge, and then the, the policy changed a little bit. So we're not going to give you the permit this year, or we're going to limit it to to less time or we're going to limit it to less people or one time they said we're going to let you in but um, you're not allowed to bring instruments and so what so this is a fandango we need the instruments so and this is a musical event and so we had all these uh, um, issues that come up every year and we have to go back we have been uh, even um, we had um, had to go to the congress uh, through one channel that we had to go in and um, enter for, for us so we can get the permit. And luckily we, we have been able to do it every year. 
Um, the other thing is the visas for artists. Uh, every time we do an event, we try to invite people from both sides, Mexico and the US. So when we invite our guests and we like them to have the experience to travel to the US and be on the American side so we can make this a binational event. And many times it's so difficult to, to get the visas for the artists, even though we do everything they request. So simple. I mean, uh, they just come in with the answer. Um, very, very uh, rude and saying like, well, I'm sorry, we're not going to give you the visa. And so, is there any reason why? Uh, well, we just don't believe that you're going to come back. And, and that's it. That's it. I mean, like one time I, I'll, I'll share this experience. We had a, a guy who is one of the best musicians in, in this song Harosho tradition, 90 years old. And the guy, he lives in the farm, I mean, by the river, he fishes every day. He's, I mean, he has a beautiful life over there, and, 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 but he's a great musician as well. Well, he asked for the visa and they told him that um, they denied the visa because they thought he was gonna wanna stay in the US. He was not gonna go back to his, he said like, if I, if I don't come back, I'll die. He said 10 minutes after this, after, I mean, like two days after, being away from my town, I'll, I'll die. So, but it was, it is like that. It was, it's, it's, it's rough. It's very tough. And, um, it's difficult to, to experience those things. And, and, um, and then, you know, the wall, how it became so important in the past administration that everybody, uh, want, or, you know, hated this concept of the wall, dividing people, dividing countries, dividing us and, uh, bringing this event this uh, festival that is uh, very human and very loving and and you know it's made out of, out of totally from the heart i mean it's, it's a beautiful example and uh, one one thing it took 13 years for people to to listen to us and and also a documentary i want to i want to say a little bit about the documentary there's a um, new documentary that came out in 2019 or actually it was done in 2019, it came out in 2020, right in the middle of the pandemic when everything was starting. That's when the, the, the documentary was gonna be released and it's called Fandango at the Wall. I'll invite you to, to see that. It'll give you a, a much better picture of what we do. But uh, thanks to the documentary, I mean, a lot of people have seen what's happening there and uh, what we do and, what we share from both countries and it's it's a beautiful piece of our art so i'll encourage you to to take a look at that it's called fandango at the wall i know you can see it on hbo uh max and um it'll be there for a couple of years so hopefully and you know due to the pandemic we haven't been able to do much more at the theaters and, and all that but uh, hopefully eventually it'll, it'll it'll be there Thank you so much, Jorge, and for, for everything that you're doing and, and for what you shared and um, so much of what you all are doing really resonates, you know, with me too and, and with AFI, you know, this idea of working between art and immigration, um, these things being so tied up together, this idea of freedom of movement like we talked about, you know, at the beginning of, of our conversation today and also this idea, you know, art and music as a tool to, to create positive social change and using it you know, for to serve the purpose of creating opportunities for peaceful dialogues and, and exchange um, and, and understanding the the very real and, and very individual aspect of these issues that um, that exist for us, like this massive issue of, you know, what happens at the border. But then when we're talking about the real people, the people that we're seeing there, um, I, I am looking forward to watching the documentary. I'm sure it's extremely powerful. Um, it looks like a lot of folks here have seen it and, and loved it. So uh, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, I, I wanna move the conversation now into, um, into talking more about allyship and, and supporting each other's work, um, supporting some of these artists that we've, we've talked to today. And, and then also, you know, hopefully to bring you guys, all of you into the conversation towards, um, towards the end here, um, to hear your feedback, your ideas, your, your suggestions. Um, I, I do wanna start briefly with Richard and Mike Hoy though. Um, when we think about allyship, you know, from the perspective of, of both of you as an artist, um, Richard, if you wouldn't mind talking just just for a minute we don't have a ton of time but 
you and you started to kind of talk about this actually earlier when you mentioned the way that the Global Fest community has has really been there for you and has stepped up in in times of um, tumult and you know intermittent displacement, so to speak. Um, I wondered if there were some things that you think you know, knowing this community as well as you do and having been part of it for so long that the community could offer or reimagine that would be helpful to, you know, to either you as a musician who finds himself in these circumstances or, or other musicians who perhaps have had similar circumstances um, or similar experiences to, to you? Well, it, it, it's hard to say. I mean, I think people just have to kind of keep their ear to the ground and know uh, which are the hot spots and which are the trouble spots. Um, sometimes it's Haiti, sometimes it's somewhere else. I mean, um, you can't just be doing it for Haitian artists or you can't just be doing it for Mexican artists or, 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 or whatever. You just kind of have to, you know, uh, keep your ear to the ground. Um, there's, uh, I'm in it for the music. I'm not, uh, I'm not really in it uh, to, uh, to be an activist, though if there is trouble and, and the people who are in trouble can't say something, then, then you know, I feel a, a, responsible, a responsibility to say something. I mean, uh, uh, one of my musicians came up to me one day and said, you know, they must, they were killing a lot of people last night and they were taking them out in wheelbarrows. You know, the, the press isn't covering it. Uh, uh, who's gonna cover it? And so sometimes you have to say things. Um, just to get the message out. Sometimes you have to speak because someone else can't speak. And so, um, and uh, the people, I, I've been lucky. I mean, people like Bill Bragg and people like uh, Greg Lucas, they keep their ear to the ground. And if they can help you out, they, they're, they're there in a flash. And other people have that, 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 uh, that possibility. I mean, uh, Jonathan Demi once, the, the late, great Jonathan Demi, I mean, uh, he was out of the blue and and was there uh, helping Haitian artists and, and uh, you know I don't you just do what you can for who you can when you can and uh, is it's about you know being open and and, and all of that uh, the visa thing is crazy it's great to hear Jorge uh, talking about the visas I mean they didn't want to give us a visa for for us to leave the other day and. Uh, and they gave everyone but two of the musicians visas. So, you know, so it's like, yeah, you can go, but you can't go with the whole band or something, you know. But we were able to put the pressure on and 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 get everyone out. I mean, it's unfair. I mean, they know these are de facto's and they know that we have to be saying this stuff. They know we have to defend our rights. And uh, and so, uh, you know, it's just a, it's just a, uh, I, I don't know, maybe having that bureaucratic lifestyle isn't, you know, they feel they have to punish the artists or something. I don't know what they're thinking. But Richard, I think you, you bring up the visa issues, which is huge. And that's something that we face, you know, as an organization, that's one of the primary reasons our organization was born was to help artists through these legal challenges, specifically visa related so often that they're facing um, when they come from countries where they were experiencing backlash. Um, you also mentioned, you know, how Folks like Bill and all these wonderful people in the in the Global Fest community have often put you up when you you know you needed a place to stay and um, we're, we're moving around and I think things even so, sort of seemingly as simple as that are are so absolutely critical um, and vital to being able to do what it is that you're there to do, which is um, create your music and and perform uh, for folks and. I think, you know, Koi, we, we sort of tried to, through Shim NYC, for example, address some of those, um, like the need for housing, the need for a place to stay, these very basic things that um, enable you as an artist to then uh, continue on, you know, creating new work and, um, and performing. Um, but another part of this kind of intermittent displacement or long-term displacement for some is not just sort of stabilizing things like a place to stay or getting your visa work sorted out. It's also developing your career as an artist in a new place wherein you probably don't have a super strong network or know a ton of people um, or have a really deep understanding of how the industry works. Uh, and when you were in residence with us, um, with Shim NYC, we tried to focus on that and you know sort of tap into our networks um, to help you to help you kind of get on that journey here in the U.S. and I, can you say a couple, you know, a couple words about as an artist in that 
situation? You know, what, what are the types of things uh, from this community that you were really looking for um, or would still like to welcome into your life as, a, as an artist who's now primarily based in the US? Yes, like as an, a performance artist, I always need to be performed and I really need shows and gigs to perform. Um, and I think I'm, I was very lucky because when I first came to the US, I, have, uh, I, I was invited to perform in a very iconic uh, venue like Joe's Bob. And uh, I performed in the, like AFI invited me to perform in underground in DC and National Saunders. So those gigs, those shows is very like, it's like the dream came true <laughs> as a performing artist. Um, and, uh, and then I had um, a very beautiful place to stay in New York for one year in right in the middle of the pandemic. Um, so I was able to work on my ongoing project, the, the autobiographical project. And, uh, and I, I feel like, like the one year residency in New York, firstly, I think it will be enough time for me to do something to build my base. But uh, when the residency ended, <laughs> I have to go to another residency in Pittsburgh. Um, and I feel like all of my connections, which just started in New York, uh, certainly uh, mm, I, I couldn't keep it. I, I, I feel I have, to, I have to start again in a new city in Pittsburgh. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's kind of a difficult for a new artist uh, who just came to the US and start a new life from the zero like me. Um, and you, you mentioned Koi too, um, you know, I mean, you're talking about maybe opportunities to stay in one place longer, right, than a year. I mean, that makes sense. We all, we all can stay in that place and maybe take a little more time to develop uh, something or work on something. And um, I, a year seems like a long time, but it's really not. Um, <laughs> yes. and, I mean, I, I think too, you know, part of the conversations we were having uh, within Shim NYC and, and with you was, you know, your interest too in finding agents and managers and um, bookers who would be interested in, in working with you, um, you know, as, and, and you had said recently, you know, with global artists specifically and um, a, a chance to talk about um, the, the work that you're developing right now. And I, I saw Boo mentioned in the chat, you know, asking if you could say a few words about the current shows that you're, that you're performing um, and how they might be an extension of Bad Activist or um, perhaps something new that you are working on um, in Pittsburgh right now with the City of Asylum. Yes, um, so I'm, I'm working on Bad Activist right now um that i'm staying in the residency of city of asylum in pittsburgh and uh, they have the venue they have the, the space for me to practice to rehearse with the band and and perform there um so the last the last show is, was really successful it was september last year september where um yeah i have my my full band with eight member performance in the stage, on the stage. And uh, I, I, I can see uh, many people like my story and my show. It was very, very, very good. Um, <laughs> but, then, but then just that, right now I, I uh, <sighs> Like all of my show was postponed before because the new COVID. So um, yeah, well, <gasps> we are we are happy that you are in Pittsburgh. But too, I mean, you're you're thinking fairly soon you're going to have to decide where you're going next. I mean, this is kind of often what 
life is like for an artist who's been displaced wherein you know they're here for one year and then they move somewhere else and then you, it's kind of constantly this trying to determine um what is what is next and where is next so to speak and i i think that um this is a community of people who can can help you to decide what's next perhaps and um we as an organization afi also rely on this community and um thinking about allyship from an organizational perspective and thinking specifically about, um, about our residency, Shim NYC, uh, you know, Matthew and, and Boo and Alex um, and Isabel, you know, from Joe's Pub, we are, we are always in the process of sort of looking for people, folks in the industry um, who could be mentors or who would be interested in speaking with um, an artist in residence like Mike Hoy to talk about the project that she's developing, um, you know, pick your brain, bounce ideas off of you, even if it's just an hour um, of your time. This this community is full of so many brilliant people and we've been very fortunate to be able to, um, you know, avail the artists in our in our residency program of, uh, of your wisdom. And we would love to hear from anyone who might have an interest in getting involved in that way. Um, and also like, you know, again, the, the amazing, incredible Joe's Pub team who has just created an entire space for our musicians and residents to, to showcase their works in progress. I mean, it's just the ultimate gift, um, both for our residency program and for the artists themselves. So um, continuing to build up partnerships with um, presenting sort of organizations and presenters like that and Mira and Habibi Fest, you know, showcasing Haig, who is our current musician in residence. It's just, it's incredible. So we welcome um, any and all of your ideas on that. Um, and I mean, Mira and Jorge, please, you know, chime in. We only have 12 minutes left. So I would love to hear, you know, any thoughts that both of you have and then welcome any If questions. I can say about time. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, hear me? Am I muted? Am I on? You're on. <laughs> Um, one year is, is funny because when I went to Haiti, I didn't even know the language. I didn't, I was looking for those voodoo rhythms and I was looking for that, for that, that really Haitian cultural thing. It took me mm -hmm. five years to put the band together and it took me another three years to put the, my first album out. And we've right. been together and the band, though it took five years to put together has now been together for 31, 32 years. So, so one year, you know, I thought I was going for six months. You know, um, and uh, so when they give you one year, you're thinking, hey, this is great. You know, I got a year and now I'm in Pittsburgh. Uh, and and I'm telling you, when I went to Haiti, it took me five years to put the guys together. And it took me another three years to get the, to put out. I put out a couple of singles before I put out the album. So so time is a whole different thing. And, and, and you know, after your one year, I'm sure they're saying, you know, well, what do you what do you got to show me, you know? It's, it's, you know, we're artists, we're trying to create. This, this stuff takes time. It takes, it takes, uh, just takes time. It takes time yeah. to incubate. And so uh, I'm, I'm there with you. I understand that 100%. Thank you, yeah. Richard. <laughs> Much appreciated. Um, Mira, Jorge, I also um, want to do something that I totally didn't warn them about, but like Matthew, Boo, Alex, Isabel, if anybody wants to chime in with your thoughts on things, and Alex is over there laughing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would like to say a, a, a few words about the, the documentary. I um, It took a, a I mean, it needs, um, we need attention to what we do. I mean, when, when, when nobody knows what you're doing, it's, it's difficult, but when, when people start knowing what you're doing and you can use whatever, you know, the nowadays is, uh, the social media and, and all these other opportunities. But, um, for us, it took, um, 12 years that we were working and hustling, I mean, organizing this event. I mean, it's totally self-supported uh, and it's community effort. We were just there to build community and, and create music and give everybody the opportunity that I, I, we believe that everybody should have in the world to, to do music, to do art. Um, I think it's a, the most natural human right. But, uh, at the same time, and then uh, it took 12 years of us to be working on this. And finally, I mean, somebody, it's probably luck, but somebody from New York, the New York Times came to report the event. 
write a beautiful article in the New York Times. And then we had the great luck that uh, um, Kabir Segal and Arturo Farrell from New York read the article and then they fall in love with the, the concept and they say, well, uh, we need to do something about this. We want to be part of this. And thanks to that uh, opportunity, I mean, we have been able to grow and do other things together also. And and we we were able to go to New York and perform. And and the beautiful work that Varda Varkard, who is the, the film director, did with the documentary uh, help a lot too. So, uh, I mean, sometimes it takes a little bit of luck, but at the same time, it's uh, a lot of uh, love and energy that we can put into this. Jorge, I think right? you make a very good point in that, you know, I, I think too what you're saying is just one or two open doors can can really make a huge change. And I, and I think that that also kind of brings it back to what Mira was saying earlier in terms of starting to reimagine, you know, how the, the presenting world can work together with artists like Richard and Koi and, and organizations like AFI. I see Mira, please chime in. I think you were gonna say something. Yeah, well, it kind of builds on that, like this concept of, of allyship and support is really like a domino effect. Like even the way the festival came about was Joe's Pub supporting Yasin, who then was able to support this community of artists. And then we were able to support artists we love who are then are able to support what, what their artistic community is. You know, one of the highlights of the festival for me was when Ezra Warda as a dancer headlined a music festival. And she, I didn't know that was so revolutionary to her. I mean, the music was amazing that accompanies this tradition. But when she was in her, you know, speaking as part of her presentation, and Ezra's in the chat and can chime in, she talked a lot about the impact it was for a dance, this dance tradition to have this space. And as we work to bring her full ensemble from Morocco over, which is like this incredible group of, of women, percussionists, dancers, singers, it's it's nice to see that like all of this is is trickling to every extension of this festival like because of this opportunity we had to invite Ezra she's also going to be able to help bring her artists over and like this energy of allyship is contagious in a great way so I think that like as someone who's just producing the festival for the first time like even the concept of allyship or or how to be collaborative and supportive in the scene, in the scene is is can be intimidating. There's so many things to tackle, but one of the ways that's really accessible is to partner with someone like AFI or someone who's an artist incubator or resettlement or a city of asylum. Like these partnerships make this work really accessible for any of the presenters in the community now who want to embark on it and don't know really what the first step is. Right, Mira, and likewise, you know, AFI could not do the work that we do to support artists in this holistic way without partnerships like the ones that we have, you know, with with Joe's Pub and with Tommy's Dot, mm -hmm. and being able to find opportunities and stages, you know, to to showcase the work of these artists. So it is th this is a very symbiotic thing, and I mean, obviously, that goes straight to this idea of allyship and how we can collaborate and kind of. Um, leverage expertise that's really what our entire residency program is about is leveraging the resources that each organization or individual brings to the table whether it's housing legal services you know a, a team that can offer support while an artist develops a new work a stage where they can perform it it, it takes a village and it you know bringing it back to to gargi at the you know the beginning of of this conference today talking about collective action um and you know what we can all do what we can all bring to the table um so and again, you know, would love to throw it back out to the to the rest of the group here. Um, who has thoughts on on that? Um, you guys are the experts in this, so I would I would selfishly love to hear your ideas as well. <laughs> somebody, somebody, chime in, or I'm going to call on someone. <laughs> <laughs> the lawyer in me, the Socratic method. <laughs> Festivals are great. I mean, uh, it's it's hard putting one together in Haiti. I'll tell you that, um, with the demonstrations and the political uprisings and stuff. Uh, but really, when they do come off, it, it, it it's really uh, the way to bring artists together and the way to bring the public together. 
and uh, and the messages come out and the people are dancing and everything's going uh, going on. You know that festival on on both sides of the border, man. That sounds that's crazy. That that that's wonderful. That's just like uh, putting it in everybody's face, and you know the fur, the birds flying back and forth. That's <laughs> I think that's a wonderful thing. Matthew, I see you have a hand up. Thank you, Richard. All right. We'd love to have you, Richard. Oh, that'd be wonderful. That'd be wonderful. Both sides of the wall. You got Haitians on the wall also now, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Man. Which upset everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Um, I think actually what you're talking about, the, the collaboration and what's interesting about AFI's role in this is the collaboration isn't just within the arts community, it's it's across different disciplines, coming in from the legal profession, coming in from uh, the social justice space, coming in from the refugee uh, services space. I was just having a conversation last night with Adrian Dorn, who many of you know from her work at uh, the Cedar Cultural Center in Minneapolis and the incredible work they've done with the Somali community there. Um, and she is now heading the um, Greater Minneapolis Area Council of Churches, which is doing a lot of social, doing social work within the, the Minneapolis St. Paul community, but seeing the arts as integral to social services. And that kind of collaboration, that kind of bringing different angles to like understanding how the arts are critical and how it, how they sit within all sorts of different aspects of society and how for society to be healthy, you have to come at, you have to, we have to work together to find ways of integrating the arts into all, into a lot of different kinds of disciplines and feeding the arts from different angles. Um, so I think, you know, what you're talking about collaboration is so critical um, and it, it has to sprawl if it's gonna really work. Thank you, Matthew. Completely agree. Um, there are some folks chiming in in, in the chat. Um, I think Isabel and Ian were hoping that maybe George would would say, say something or, or share something. Um, oh, I see. Okay. You. Okay. okay. <laughs> oh, hi everybody. This has been really wonderful. Um, uh, I found this. It's been really great to learn about a lot of these. Uh, a lot of your various activities and things that have been going on and things I wasn't aware of. Um, I guess one thing I would just throw out there is that I feel like um, it, like a forum like this brings together, and I know this is an ongoing thing, uh, it, it, which Global Fest is really at the heart of, but other, you know, many of your other, your other organizations and so forth is sort of when you have a lot of intensive contact between people working on different projects and also working in different fields, whether they're legal, whether they're, you know, like documentaries, um, organizing festivals. But I feel like um, one of the things I would definitely emphasize is that when we face these restrictions, like where we have to work very hard to even make international travel possible to try to soften visa type restrictions. And in some cases, these are insurmountable. And so I feel like there's a kind of hybrid uh, level of, of activity where to compartmentalize as, as little as possible what is it is possible to mount and present, say, in the U.S. on, in the sort of spirit of advocacy, but also in the spirit of just celebrating music and artists who can be brought or who are here and giving them, you know, exposure and vis visibility and so forth with audiences, but also those who are, um, you know, in situations where they can't even possibly, it, it, it wouldn't possibly be feasible to. Uh, Bring them like a good example might be like you know uh hamid asadi came up today and he's it's been just such a blessing for him to have his presence here um but if you think about like you know musicians in basra who wouldn't necessarily have the renown i mean hamid asadi is like one of the absolute most accomplished singers of uh iraqi maqam but there's so many other genres in iraq um and places you know if you look at a place like basra or a place like uh, you know um, um um, Qasr or like, you know, just lots of different localities. There's sort of localized groups. And on one hand, I don't think we'd even want to necessarily remove people from their circumstances, but in some cases we do because their circumstances are completely untenable. But 
when people are in, you know, basically settled in where they are, but it is impossible to sort of reach them. Um, they're, they're, I think, you know, kind of building networks that kind of simultaneously focus on internationally mobile uh, artists and also people who are, um, you know, can't be mobile or, you know, it's unfeasible for them to be mobile, uh, mobile and try to put them in the same space in, in, as much, in as much as possible. I think that's something I would advocate for. Mm. Thank you, absolutely, George. Um, I, I appreciate you chiming in and uh, contributing that to the conversation. Um, we are we are definitely out of time, but I, I want to um, thank very deeply all of the speakers that were here with us today, um, sharing your thoughts, your work. Um, and I wanna thank those of you in this community who have already been so supportive um, of you know, what we have been doing of the artists that we're talking about here today. I want to uh, very profoundly thank the, the Global Fest and Wavelengths um, team for inviting us to, to share this space uh, with you all today. And um, Bill, if you still would like to say one last thing, I would love for you to have the last word. <laughs> wow, I <laughs> really uh... The last word with a group of people is quite a lot of responsibility. Uh, and this is a great panel. And I've got so much respect for everybody who has been on the virtual stage. I was actually just going to address, there was a question from Doug Joris in the chat about what universities and colleges can do. And it's something that we did when Richard and Ram were here in Abu Dhabi. Uh, and there's also so much conversations about how difficult it is to travel, how hard it is to get reasonable touring fees, trying to kind of slow everything down. Uh, and if you are at an institution that can bring artists in for a residency and get them not only on stage, but really deeply into the curriculum and not just into the music curriculum or the arts curriculum, but into social sciences, into policy conversations, into classes with people who might be playing a role in human rights issues. Uh, throughout the kind of throughout their career path so that they start to become sensitive to the issues, uh, kind of embedding the artist as a real source of knowledge. And I, I keep coming back to the story of Richard being in a, in a Latin American post-colonial studies class and an interaction that he had with an Emirati student here about the similarity between kind of traditional culture and contemporary culture and navigating the two and that kind of conversation has resonated so deeply for a really long period of time so i just want to sort of encourage especially if you're not just in a, in a festival or nightclub setting and you've got a chance to have artists sit down uh, and also even with what lisa safford did you know the kind of work that around did playing in schools and doing education programs. It provided a base and a stability over an extended period of time that brought the work to a completely different audience than the people who come to festivals and clubs and concerts. Here, here. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And thank you all for being here with us today. Thank you, Ashley. Bye. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, um, Ashley and Thanks all the panelists uh, for your incredible contributions today. It was uh, so exciting to hear from you um, and really feel those um, activation points that we're trying to <laughs> find, um, you know, different, different ways to support the community and you know, I, I think the the will is there from everyone in this room, but knowing uh, that there are programs in place and places to look to actually make these uh, ideas a reality and uh, people striving for even more um, opportunities um, is uh, very heartening. Uh, so thank you all for your participation. Um, we're about to um, jump into our next uh, panel, which is our music sync panel. Um, before we do that, I do just want to quickly uh, thank, uh, again, the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, but also the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, uh, and particularly uh, Jan Arts NYC, which we are so thrilled to be a part of, um, both Global Fest and Wavelengths, um, a huge network of supporting organizations in New York um, and programs that have happened uh, throughout the month. I think this year goes until February 5th. Uh, if you go to janartsnyc.org, there are there's a lot more information about the uh, programs involved 
Um, and again, part of uh, Janet's NYC is Wavelengths uh, and uh, Global Fest itself, which this year um, we were excited to do the second year of Tiny Desk and Global Fest. Um, so I'd love to call up uh, Sean to thank uh, to the chat, uh, just maybe to speak a little bit more about uh, Tiny Desk and uh, where we've been. Uh, and there's Sean to thank, Global Fest uh, co director, uh, co curator. Uh, and among many other things, uh, so excited to have her. <laughs> and sister, also and sister, sister of <laughs> me and the world, a global sister. In, in um, hi all. Uh, just want to point your attention to uh, the survey that's popping up the poll. So fill that out if you can. If you just joined, especially, we want to make sure that we. Uh, capture that information. Uh, in the spirit of that previous panel of collaboration of how we all work together, we have just had such an incredible partnership with Tiny Desk and NPR Music and just want to use this opportunity as a mini commercial for ourselves, Global Fest meets Tiny Desk. Uh, it has been such an incredible way for artists to be introduced to a larger community and want to make sure that you can point your audiences to that content and absolutely, um, and showcase, you know, of course, these incredible nine artists and their videos and also their cultures. Those, they are the great culture carriers and would love to get the word out about those videos. And of course, we wanna make sure that we can continue all of these virtual experiences that we've been able to have through this time. I think we're hearing all about the great stories of perseverance and certainly our partnership with Tiny Desk has allowed Global Fest and our Global Fest artists to persevere in this time. So please check that out and I'll turn it back over to Ian. <laughs>